Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and today I'm finally going to be reviewing the Bamboo Labs X1C FDM 3D printer. Yes, it's been out for almost a year at this point, but we finally were able to get our hands on one from Bamboo Labs. Thank you for them sending us this review unit. And to be honest, over the past couple years, I've been more enamored and interested in resin printing. I mean, we've tested FDM printers way back for over 10 years now. We've built the first MakerBots, we reviewed Ultimakers, Prusas, Lulzbots, uh, but from my perspective, a lot of the excitement in the 3D printing space has really been over on the resin side with some of the accessibility and fast-paced releases of those products, especially for tabletop miniatures. Uh, and so it took a lot for me to get interested in a new FDM printer. But after hearing some of the people I trust really gush and give glowing reviews about the Bamboo Labs printers, I had to check it out. So today, I'll be giving an overview of my experience of this printer. If you haven't been deep in the 3D printing community and you haven't heard about these printers, uh, this may be useful and informative for you. And I'll also be sharing some of my print experiences and going uh, diving deep into some of our Benchy testing where I push the printer's speed to its limits. Let's get started. So what makes the Bamboo Labs X1 and X1C specifically here uh, unique? Uh, well, it's one of the first core XY printers we've tested. These are printers like the Voron, uh, the Ender 6, I believe, is core XY. And fundamentally, it moves its print head uh, in a different way than some of the classic 3D printers that we've used, some of the ones that you might find really uh, affordable and accessible, and even some like the ones from Prusa. So as opposed to using stepper motors to directly move the hot end um, up and down and left and right over this three, uh, three axis uh, volume, uh, what you have here is instead a bed that moves up and down over these rails really quickly, and then that's the Z axis and the X, Y axis get controlled via this core X, Y belt system uh, built off of these carbon fiber rails. Uh, relatively light, extrusion head and very sturdy carbon fiber rails and using this intertwined belt system able to move very, very quickly. So in terms of speeds, we're talking about up to 500 millimeters per second of travel speed um, when moving from point to point, slows a little bit down to about 300 millimeters, up to 300 millimeters per second when you're actually printing, but still that's like four or five times faster than you would normally be moving your X and Y axes uh, on a traditional 3D printer. Now, when you're moving that print head that fast, you may have prints that are prone to errors. And so to compensate for that, there is a bit of auto calibration that happens that you can run before every print. Not only is there bed leveling, which is pretty standard now among 3D printers, where they'll tap the different points on your build plate, uh, you also have a couple unique features, one of which is a LiDAR sensor attached to the side of that hot end, and that will scan the uh, first layer of your print if you're using their standard cool plate uh, or their engineering plate, not their PEI textured plate. Uh, and so if you have an error on that first print layer, which is where many of potential errors could occur uh, in FDM printing, it will let you know and stop that print. Uh, it will also compensate for uh, vibration resonance. And this is a new thing uh, called input shaping that's been very popular in the Voron printers. And the idea is that there is an accelerometer also on that hot end. And with every print, it'll actually run through a series of vibration tests where it'll slowly kind of vibrate and hum that hot end higher, higher pitch, uh, and it'll detect where those vibrations, how it's moving at those high speeds, and then compensate for some of, not the vibration itself, but the resonance, so you don't have, at high speeds, the print errors. Thank you. 
Now that allows the printer to move not only quickly and reliably for good prints, but one of the best things I think uh, about this printer is, is some of the uh, ease of use, some of these convenient features. Yes, the auto bed leveling and the first layer detection and the high speed, that's all great, but when you have the filament loaded in, uh, whether it's through this AMS optional uh, on automatic material uh, system or just a spool in the back, uh, starting up a print is an automated process. You're using their Bamboo Studio uh, desktop app or their phone app. You're starting prints, which gets sent up to their cloud service, downloads over Wi-Fi or LAN connection to the printer, uh, and then it just runs. There's no uh, need to go in and wipe off the, uh, the, the nozzle. There's no need to uh, flush out filament manually and scrape it off. All of that is automated now because in the back of the printer, it actually does some pre-printing, um, some maintenance. It'll flush out some filament, run that hot end for a little bit, and then there is a nozzle wiper as well as a filament cutter that then drops out the back. You may have seen this drops out of the back in there's no better phrase for it, but a poop shoot at the back, a little bit of filament waste uh, that then you can collect in a bucket or uh, many design people have designed uh, some uh, some catch buckets to catch all this filament waste. And what that means is that from the moment you start a print, if you start, you can start it remotely, you can basically just walk away. Uh, and the reason you can walk away is because information via a camera is sent to the software, which then you can view on the desktop or on your phone. This all goes through their cloud service. And so uh, on the X1 series, and also I believe on the P1P series, there's a little camera on the corner there, as well as a light bar. And that camera you can set to record a time lapse of the entire print at 1080p, as well as anytime remote in and check in on your prints. Uh, the camera will also do a little bit of automatic detection. So if it detects some uh, spaghetti filament, so if a layer doesn't perfectly adhere, if an object snaps off and you're getting filament spaghetti everywhere, the camera, via various degrees of sensitivity will let you know and halt the print, pause the print, and say, we detected some spaghetti. Would you like to resume? Would you like to cancel this print? Which could save you a ton of mess. No more, no longer am I you know, starting a print overnight, waking up and seeing a mess of spaghetti. Worst case, a print fails, and it's failed a handful of times, and it stopped that print, and then I just go back and uh, clean it up or start it all over again. Uh, same with the convenience that's afforded by this AMS, the automatic material system. It's a system that ostensibly is designed for you know, multicolor 3D printing, and multi-material, multicolor 3D printing is it's not a new technology. We've seen companies like Mosaic in the past with their palette products have ways of fusing filaments together and switching. And Prusa has had a multi-material system for a while. Uh, this multi-material system I think of as, yes, it's great for and very effective for multi-color printing. So you can have four colors and if you can actually chain these with up to four of them, so up to 16 different colors uh, in a print, and so the way multicolor prints work is you can have different, someone in the design process can design a different 3D model for each color, and then those 3D models are perfectly fitted together via the software, and so something like this 20-sided dice, each number is actually not just a paint application on top, but it's actually inlaid. It's a 3D model that's inlaid to the dice itself. And so the software loads in the multiple models. You then select which color you want per each of that model. And then the slicer will then decide and, and figure out per layer, each of these print layers, uh, when to switch from one color to the next. It does add a ton of time to the 3D printing process because basically for every color switch, for every layer that has more than one color, you are flushing a bunch of wasteful filaments. You are creating a prime tower to make sure your prints are uh, smooth and you don't get any of the uh, bubbling or um, you get clean layer lines for each, uh, for each new color. 
And it takes, for something like this 20-sided die, took over 10 hours, even though this was only two colors, and did almost 100 different color switches, which means a bunch of flushed and waste material. Uh, you're going to compound that with every additional color, and so you're going to also need to potentially reorient this, or one way to maximize efficiency is to print multiple elements at once, multiple objects at once, because you're only flushing the filament one time per color change, so might as well print many, many objects, similar objects at the same time. Batch printing is one way to mitigate that waste. Uh, but the software also has a neat feature where you can adjust the color of a model uh, using kind of like a paintbrush method. And you can actually use your mouse cursor and brush on different colors. You can use a paint bucket, like a Photoshop style paint bucket, and say, I want this plane, this surface to be a certain color. Or you can use a slider and say, you can base it on the layer height. So everything above a certain layer height, uh, like for this badge here, everything above the relief, I want it to be a separate color, uh, which is a really easy and accessible way to do multi-material, uh, multi-color printing. Um, if you, again, have to deal with a little bit of that filament waste. Uh, I ended up not doing a ton of multi-material or multi-color printing uh, just because it was so time consuming. It really took away a lot of the advantages of the speed of this Core XY style printer. Um, it was a lot of wasteful filament, even though you can calibrate you know, the flushing volumes and kind of minimize that prime tower. Or you can put that flush material into a separate object in itself if you don't care about the color there. But the AMS system was really convenient, I found, for just switching between colors between prints. So if I want to use a matte back print, if I want to switch between PLA and polycarbonate or ABS, having four different roles kind of at the ready to be loaded automatically via the software was just a huge time saver. Uh, and technically, you actually get five rolls because not only do you have the four in here, but also you can still access the spool in the back. And so if, you have, uh, if you're printing TPU, for example, you want flexible filament and that needs to be processed and are stored in a, in a different environment than your PLA, uh, then you might use the spool in the back. And then all you have to do is manually switch over your feeding tube from the AMS over to the spool and load that up. And you basically have five really quick change color options to do between prints. And all of this means the speediness of a print, um, the reliability of at high speeds, the convenience of being able to switch between colors between your prints or do multi-color, multi-material printing, and also uh, that uh, quick preparation, auto-leveling, the uh, flushing of the filament, off the poop shoot, uh, all that just made printing that much faster and that much more enjoyable. And yes, you can still tweak innumerable number of settings in their slicer, you know, from changing your, uh, your support styles to your print speeds, your infill styles, your top layer styles. You can do things now like ironing, which is a really cool thing where you can um, have the hot end actually heat up and rub across your top layer surfaces so that you get rid of those telltale signs of FDM printing. No longer do you see like the pattern of the top layer. It becomes it's really nice, smooth surface. That's a really nice feature that I've been liking. Um, all of these things make FDM printing that much more fun and accessible. And the prints, even at the highest resolution that I was printing at, uh, 0.08 millimeters, yeah, the layer heights are thicker than even the standard layer height at 0.05 millimeters I'd be doing on a resin print. You know, printing a, a tabletop miniature or a bust like this Darth Vader that I would have been printing with a resin printer, the quality is really there. I mean, looking at the curvature of the helmet, this was printed without supports. This was printed basically at this 30 degree angle at full speed, and I can barely see any of the telltale signs of the drooping of, uh, uh, of the overhangs, uh, and the helmet here just looks perfect. And without having to do all the kind of messy and toxic cleanup, no isopropyl alcohol needed here uh, that I'd be doing with a resin print, it's making me, again, like I said, fall back in love with FDM printing. The build volume is 256 by 256 by 256 millimeters cubed. And the largest print I did test on was this 
moon lamp, which isn't quite that volume. And there's a little bit of a caveat. So while that's like a 10 inch by 10 inch by 10 inch build volume, you don't actually get that full Z height without some modifications and adjustments to the printer. There's an area in the XY plane that's reserved for the filament cutter in the back. And so you have to disable that and remove some parts if you really want to get that full build volume. But this is a nice size for a FDM printer. And something like this took uh, 36 hours. Very nervous watching this print without supports, but it printed basically perfectly uh, and used about 200 grams of filament here. And I'm really happy with this right out of the printer, nice looking print. I've been also doing a lot of uh, flexi prints, you know, printing toys for my kids. And this is something that I wouldn't be comfortable necessarily doing with the with a, a resin printer because despite the cleanup I'd be doing with it, uh, you know there could be some uncured resin on the inside of the models. But printing PLA toys, I can print a toy in two to three hours, something like this, super quick. Do something really complex like a dragon, print it overnight, and my kids get new toys in the morning. And the number of designers now working and doing these uh, print in place flexi prints that you can find, I can buy for under $4 a model have really made the fun of FDM printing, again, uh, brought the joy back into it uh, with services like you know, My Mini Factory and, and Colts 3D and Principles, of course. Now, one thing I was really curious about was uh, how easy it would be to uh, slow or speed up a print. Because you go in the slicer, you go into Bamboo Studio, and there's so many options that it is a little bit daunting. You can change your max speeds up to you know, like 500 millimeters per second, but you're not gonna wanna do that while it's printing. And there are variables like the flow volume, the volumetric flow of the nozzle that really gate the, uh, the, the print per filament type. And what Bamboo also has done is on the, on the actual control panel itself and on the desktop and uh, the smartphone app, there are some presets. So there's a standard printing preset. You slice the model, you configured it, you use maybe their default settings on the slicer, which have worked great. Uh, the model's been uploaded now onto uh, the printer via the cloud service, via LAN, or via a micro SD card. And when you start printing at any point, you can actually go into the settings and you can change the print speed to four presets. You can change it from a standard mode to a silent printing, which is 50% speed, to a sport print setting, which is 124% uh, speed, uh, or to a ludicrous speed setting, which is 160% print speed. Uh, and all of that is done without having to re-slice the model, without having to do new calculations. It literally is just using some onboard presets to speed up the print. Um, and you can compensate for some of that by maybe increasing uh, the temperature of your hot end by five to 10 degrees, which I find has helped. Uh, but that's where I want to test this Benchy print model because you could slice a Benchy, a standard Benchy is maybe 40 minutes to print. And it looks good, it looks great out of this. 40 minute Benchy print is pretty fast by normal standards. If you throw that in here and then you jump up to a sport speed or ludicrous speed, you're taking that down to well under 30 minutes at the fastest speed. Uh, but I was wondering how would that affect the model? Even if it prints out perfectly, does that affect the surface geometry? What does that look like potentially on the inside? And in fact, there's even a, a faster preset for a Benchy that, you that comes preloaded into the printer, which prints a Benchy out in 17 minutes. And you can print that Benchy, and then also, after that fact, while it's printing, adjust the speed to go to sport speed or ludicrous speed, uh, or silent speed, and slow it down. And at ludicrous speed, you're talking about a Benchy in under 14 minutes from the moment the nozzle touches the build plate on that first layer. That is insane! And so what I did was I did a bunch of Benchy prints. We made this display rack for it. That's a little more than a display rack because we took this to our friends at Lumafield who have a CT scanner. You've seen some of our videos, you may have seen them, where we've taken some of our objects through this CT scanner and asked them if they could scan 
these benchies, this benchy rack for us, for a standard benchy slice, for the preset benchy slice, and then for each tier here, I have printed a silent setting, the standard setting, the sport setting, and the ludicrous speed setting. And then with their software, I can actually go on, on their website and actually look on the inside and see, well, what does it actually look like in that infill? What does that filament look like? And on the outside, I can tell you that there are minor differences. I mean, the fastest print here I have paired to like a standard benchy print. Yeah, you can tell there's a little bit of lower surface detail. That back text doesn't read perfectly, but the overhangs are pretty comparable at that point to layer height. Now on the inside though, a lot more uh, a spaghetti mess that you can see. And this is uh, credit to uh, the slicing software where a modern FDM print slicing software prioritizes the finish on the outside and uh, the settings that increase the speed. Uh, actually, all of any potential defects happen on the inside. And so a little bit of stringing, you can see a little bit of that spaghetti filament on the inside of this print. And that may structurally affect the quality if you need something at a certain uh, structural integrity. Uh, but as an aesthetic piece, as something that you're just gonna be put on your table, printing at the ludicrous speed, as long as you have good bed adhesion, um, is something that's actually doable. And the sport speed I found very comfortably, and I'm not printing something with large overhangs, I basically turn on that 124% sport speed. And for prints that take nine hours, that's shaving off over an hour and a half uh, of those prints, which is really, really meaningful. So what are the downsides of the bamboo printers and the, the X1, X1C here? Well, it's, it's a closed system. So while the Voron Core XY printers are open source and you can buy parts from a variety of different suppliers and different kits that you could use, here you gotta get the parts from Bamboo. And to their credit, they've made parts available, replacement parts available for everything from parts for the AMS to different size uh, extruders, uh, different build plates, uh, pretty readily accessible with distribution all over uh, the US and internationally. Uh, filament, you can use any type of filament. So they, while they do sell their own filament and it's cheaper to buy it without the, uh, the plastic spool, you can print your own spools even. Um, you can get cheaper filament in a bunch of different places and you can just configure the presets. Um, it'll work with filament from Matter Hackers. It'll work with most filaments that I tested out there with a little bit of the temperature uh, setting on that hot end and basically printing still at that full core XY speed. The one benefit you get from using their filament is they have RFID chips on each roll, each spool. And so not only does that allow the AMS and the system to know uh, what type of filament it is and even what color it is, it actually is key to this spool specifically. And so if you're changing filaments and you take a spool out and you've you know printed 500 grams already, Ready. The next time you put this back in, it'll recognize it and it will actually have a, a rough indicator of, okay, this is that spool that's still only half full. It's a nice convenient thing, uh, but not a necessity if you want to get the best bang for your buck. Uh, the AMS has some limitations in terms of the width of spools. So there are some modifications. You get a, a Hydra mod that Matter Hacker sells. You can print yourself, allows for wider spools, a little bit more effective, and tons of people already doing their own modifications um, for the, you know, the back poop chute, for different things that you can mount on the inside, just for, uh, so some, some uh, quality of life improvements for the X1, X1C, which is, uses the steel nozzles. You can print carbon fiber infused filaments, uh, and the P1P, the more bare bones model, which uh, sells for much less. Uh, but this thing is basically $1,500 with the AMS now, $350 less if you don't want the AMS. I didn't think that the AMS was gonna be a necessity for me. Um, it was gonna be a nice to have because I wasn't planning on doing a lot of multicolor, multi-material printing, but the convenience of being able to switch colors quickly, that makes this, I think, an essential buy. And that kit that you can get on Matter Hackers for, with the AMS, a couple spools of filament for the X1C uh, seems like a pretty great deal. Uh, if you wanna spend less money, the P1P is available and that just has 
uh, fewer options, no LiDAR detector, it doesn't have the walls, but you can print your own, own walls, uh, but it's still the core XY design. And you know they've been updating the software and firmware for all these components on a pretty regular basis. So some of the complaints I saw other reviewers talk about over the past uh, nine months or so, a lot of that has already been addressed. Um, in their new firmware and software. And I've been enjoying the spit out of it. I don't know what else I can say. I mean, I, I'm not fully back on you know, FDM only. I think I'm gonna be printing both resin prints and FDM going forward, but really changes what I think, how I think about projects going forward and some of the limits, some of the dioramas projects that I've been making in the past where I've been relying on big resin prints. Maybe I'm gonna to turn to some FDM prints now. And it's definitely the quality is there where it doesn't feel like it's wearing that telltale FDM layer height on its shoulder and speed really unbelievable. Uh, the table does vibrate a bit when you have this at that max speed, but all the prints turned out wonderfully because of that input shaping. Uh, I know there are a bunch of other options out there, Voron printers, uh, Prusa has their new Mark IV printer out, and they're promising input shaping as well with some uh, firmware updates, some of the presets that they're going to be releasing uh, to allow for fast prints. I think they shared a video where they had a bench sheet printing in about 20 minutes. Uh, but if you want something that's been kind of proven out there, this isn't a product that just launched. It launched last summer, and people, the community, a great community uh, online have been really, have really embraced it, it's a pretty safe bet to jump in uh, as a first printer. I know some people have called it maybe the Tesla of, of 3D printers. I think it more like the, what DJI did for hobbyist drones. It made it way more accessible. You couldn't tune it necessarily as much as a, 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 you know, a racing drone and you weren't building your own, but we kind of paid our dues. We've built plenty of 3D printers in the past, and right now, at this point in my life, I just want something that works out of the box, and this definitely delivers that. Uh, we'll be using it in future build videos and ongoing testing. Um, I have links below for all the models that I showed here, as well as those CT scans of these benches, so you can browse through and, and fly through the models yourself to check those out. Thank you, LumaField, for doing that scanning for us. And if you have questions about the Bamboo Labs X1C FDM 3D printer, please post them in the comments below. But thank you so much for watching. I'm going to get back to printing. I can't stop printing. I'll see you next time. Ow.